When you look out from the eyes in your head, what do you see? What do you really see? Do you see what's there in the landscape where you live? Not its shadow or reflection or what you've been told lies there. Not just the present surface, but what came before. Do you understand what you see? And what if you don't understand? Are you willing to find out for yourself what is there? What's really there in the landscape when you look out from the eyes in your head? So let us begin. Let me show you something of this man of my own place, something remarkable on him. Like a coast has things which stand out like a white house or a clump of trees. Some such thing which has not heretofore been revealed of this man, who moved off from another place where he was born, who moved most gradually from this center out as far as a man then could go. And does it matter how far? As long as it is far. Can you say how far far is? You shall see this man move as far as space goes as you too have the opportunity to move. Outside the piazza of our camp, summer camp, at the border of Stageford Park, which is now known to me as Fisherman's Field. And when I was a little boy, I used to see these men smoke and talk in the summer darkness, and the, had that quietness and fullness of nature to just sit where it was pleasant on the summer evening, like Chinese or Japanese or Indian. Or Italians, or Mesopotamians, or Hittites, or Greeks, or anybody that's ever lived in this earth knows that the earth is, is the geography of our being. My father was a letter carrier, and his uniforms were constantly in need of patching, particularly on the shoulder, where the bag was carried, and along the side of the coat, where the bottom of the bag wore the cloth away. In my father's mail pouch, I learned the love of letters. This was at Gloucester, letter 27, withheld. I come back to the geography of it. The land falling off to the left, where my father shot his scabby golf, and the rest of us played baseball into the summer darkness until no flies could be seen and we came home to our various piazzas with the women. But there is no strict personal order for my inheritance. No Greek will be able to discriminate my body. An American is a complex of occasions, themselves a geometry of spatial nature. I have this sense that I am one with my skin. Plus this, plus this, that forever the geography leans in on me. I compel backwards, I compel. Gloucester to yield to change. Polis is this.
he likes to use that word so much, a Greek word, for the city-state, you know. And polis is eyes. Polis is those that you can personally know. I mean, the city-state, the Greeks said, it should be no larger than you can walk around the circumference of in two days. So that's the local again. And then from that, it just, it, the, the thing takes over. The poem takes over. The epic takes over. You, you cannot stay in the local. No matter how much you root in the local, you can't stay there because they, you know, like a tree, your arms go to heaven. In reading Olson, you could care a lot about the imagination of a world, watching it begin in a place. And you come to know quite a little something about the history of yourselves in that place. But the question, it, it's why are we interested in Troy, for example? It has to begin in some place, and then to watch human activity make a world. So Gloucester will fascinate anybody that is aware that we make our world if we are truly men and women in the world. When I first met him and had a terrible time with that New England history because it's so detailed, I began tracking it myself. He said, oh, don't do that. I said, you know, that, this is my place. You go do it for yours. I remember, he said, a very, super, very familiar face. I might have given him a haircut, yeah. I was interested in the beats, and Kerouac was a New England guy, and he'd talk about the New York scenes, and then you know, Ginsburg in the village, and, and he'd talk about, well, if you go to Gloucester, there's this poet Charles Olson there. And I find them people, like, you know, they're a little bit too intellectual for me. I'm more like, you know, you know, direct understanding, correct? You know what I'm saying? Charles Olson is my teacher. I don't know anyone who had more freedom in his heart than Charles Olson. He changed my entire life. Can you tell me about Charles Olson? Charles or, Olson? Yeah, you ever hear of him? The poet? Yeah. Yeah, the big guy. Yeah, the big guy. I grew up down at Berean Beach, and he used to walk the beach, and he wrote poems about us. My, the, all the kids I grew up with I went to the bookstore, and you'll find uh, a book by Charles Olson, and he writes about the kids on the beach. That's all me and my friends growing up. And I'm not a big poetry reader. You're not? No. How come? But, uh, I don't know how come. I just have so many other things I sort of get absorbed in, and uh, don't get to the poetry part of it. Hey, John. Hey, how you doing? Why do you think people don't read poetry? Reading is all about getting uh, left brain information. It's about reading the Wall Street Journal. It's about reading nonfiction stuff. It's about reading law books. A lot of people don't get reading just for reading sick. And that's what poetry is all about. And if you don't get that, actual earth of value to construct one. From rhythm to image, and image is knowing, and knowing, Confucius says, brings one to the goal. Nothing is possible without doing it. It is where the test lies, malgré all the thought and all the pell-mell of proposing it, or thinking it out, or living it ahead of time. <laughs> 